Aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this, what feels like a very blustery day here in Honolulu, wherever you're tuning in from, we welcome you. My name is Andrea Nandoskar, and I'm the Education Program Manager at Historic Hawaii Foundation. And you're here because this is the third lecture in the 36th Annual Experts Historic Preservation Lecture Series. I want to send a big mahalo to our event partner, Dr. Ralph Kam. He's the curator and coordinator of the expert series. Dr. Kam is a lecturer with the Historic Preservation Graduate Certificate Program, American Studies Department at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. HHF is very pleased to co-sponsor this series and this year's theme, for those who are tuning in for the first time, is Historic Cemeteries. Uh, just to note, all of the lectures are being uh, recorded. The HHF YouTube channel will have this recording available. It's being live streamed actually right now on Facebook and YouTube, so you can see that on bo in both places immediately afterwards and share it if you would like. Um, as we go along, if questions come up, please type them into the chat. My colleague, Michelle Kisek, and myself will be monitoring the chat. And um, our speaker will respond to Q&A during that portion of the event, which will be towards the end. So if you can also um, take a brief moment after this ends when you log out to complete the survey, we'd be most grateful. It's really helpful for our organization. For anyone who is new to Historic Hawaii Foundation, we're a statewide nonprofit. We help people save historic places. We help them save places and sites and cultural sites that tell the stories of the multi-layered history of Hawaii. And we do this through education, advocacy, assistance, and protection of and for historic places. I would now like to warmly welcome Dr. Ralph Kam, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you so much, Ralph. Certainly. Thank you, Andrea. So, uh, Laura Ruby, I was so happy when she agreed to, uh, to speak to us today, because she's one of those people that is ubiquitous. Um, everywhere I would go, I would see something by Laura Ruby. Uh, I went down to the Legislative Reference Bureau. There was a, a print of hers on the wall near the exit. If I would go down to Sea Fortune to eat dim sum, there was a, a outdoor, uh, outdoor sculpture that was at the entrance to the parking structure that I parked at. So Laura Ruby's work is um, in many, in many places. And it's so good that she uh, will be talking to us on one of one of her projects. Uh, she is the 2015 Hawaii Living Treasure honoree. And in 2008, she received the Hawaii Individual Artist Fellowship. 
which is the highest honor in the visual arts. Since 2012, Laura's been the co-coordinator co of the Moiliili Japanese Cemetery Beautification Project, along with Anne Nakata and Harriet Natsuyama. Thanks to the kindness of hundreds of donors and the strong support of many volunteers, the beautification project has built a 556 foot bluestone wall, uh, many washing stones and benches and planted more than 90 trees, including uh, nine ohia. Uh, Laura has edited the book Moiliili, The Life of a Community in 2005 and co-authored the books Honolulu Town in 2012 and Honoka'a Town in 2015 with Ross Stevenson. Laura taught art and honors at the University of Hawaii for 34 years. And as I pointed out, her prints and sculptures have been shown in national and international solo, juried, and invitational exhibits and sprinkled throughout Hawaii. Her essay and a selection of her prints from the Nancy Drew series are published in Rediscovering Nancy Drew, 1995. She continues to create her Diamond Head series of prints and installation sculptures. She has created a large site-specific sculptures, including the Battle of Moiliili, uh, 2016, a Chinatown site of passage, 1994, uh, stage, set, mise, and scene, 1991, and Cromlech in 1980. She is currently working as a researcher and writer compiling historical photographs, documents, and interviews as part of the Honoka'a Town Project. So I'd like you all to welcome Laura Ruby. Thank you very much. Um, uh, in my beginning, I wanna thank uh, the Hawaii um, Historic Foundation and Ralph Cam for inviting me to do this. And if this has been, you know, uh, if I can say one of my passions to continue to try to um, bring Mo Ili Ili into its full, um, oh, I guess you could say ownership of what it's like to be a part of a community. Okay, I'm gonna have to ask you to, I'm not sure how to go forward. Laura, try your down arrow on your keyboard. Uh, no, not working. It was working a minute ago. Um, uh, let's see. Let's see where else. You you can. There. Okay. There's okay. another little All arrow right. on the side. Yes. Oh, sorry. Hey, welcome everyone. Uh, this is about uh, this is about the Moili Ili Japanese Cemetery. But I need to give a little bit of background for the community itself. Um, naturally, I'd love to talk about the whole of the community at a at another. Um, presentation. But um, just to give you a reference of where it is, you probably have seen it if you're coming off the freeway on Kapiolani, and it looks like a lot of black stones. But currently, because our trees are growing, you will see a green fringe around the cemetery. And just to let you know, this is Kuhio School right here. Can you see my cursor? I hope you can. And then right up here is the Humane Society. And then further, um, Mauka is the uh, University of Hawaii. And uh, to give you just a little bit of background, how about the name? Uh, Mo Ili Ili is the correct way. Now, over the years, people hear things differently and they might say Mo Lili, or they might say uh, something, um, uh, something else that sounds like it. It's just because that's what they heard. And lots of times people contract um, names, but it's Mo Ili Ili, or spelled all of the different ways. And just to let you know, this is why it is called that, because the uh, sugarloaf basalt that you can see is really the bluestone um, lava that flowed from um, Pu'ukakea on, on Tantalus. And it flowed down and it kept the community at a high level, which was first the Hawaiian community, and then it became the um, Japanese American community. So down in the lower right, uh, you see a little cross there. That's the Kamo Ili Ili Church, and it was originally um, the um, church and the cemetery. And right across the street, where Kuhio School 
is. Um, it was the school. So there's three pillars of any um, community, and it's the church, the school, and the cemetery. So what happened with the Japanese Americans? Well, they first settled over here in the alluvium, uh, the, they, and the karst, that is the coral uh, outcroppings, and it was flooding all the time. And when they set up their um, uh, temple and um, their school, uh, they couldn't have a cemetery there because it would sometimes be underwater. So instead, they found a place that was right near the um, existing Hawaiian community cemetery, and they finally petitioned to get uh, it in use. The, the uh, governor the governor people at the time said, oh, we don't know if we want to have a cemetery there, but I don't know how they could justify it because just a block away was uh, the actual Hawaiian cemetery. Uh, anyway, they got it. It was called first. It was first for the one um, Buddhist sect, but then they quickly opened it up to all Buddhist sects. Sect. And today there are uh, many, many Christian ones and people without any um, religious affiliation. And there, there are many, many ethnic groups uh, uh, represented in there. And there's about 2,000 grave sites. We call them Hakka. Uh, and there's about 10,000 people there. So you notice that the the the, um, uh, the flow of the land is pretty important because in the area which is alluvium, that is a place where the um, uh, oh badly um, high 43-story 43, uh, a uh, condominium is supposed to go in. It's on alluvium. That's jello land. That's um, going to be um, a real concern with something that goes higher than any other building in, in the town. Ask, ask me in the chat. Excuse me. Ask me in the chat for some more information. Okay, this is the this is the old um, map from 1881, which just shows the um, uh, configurations of the Ely's. Oh, this is this is not good. Okay, um, and um, they. Cemetery is right here in this location. You notice the stream flowing here. But what happened, of course, is the Manoa stream came in and straightened out everything. And, and then Kapiolani came in and cut off part of the actual Ely of Kuile. This is what it would have looked. It's, this is not, this is Waikiki and going towards Malka, but it would just show you this would have been part of the um, uh, location. Um, Notice the squarish nature. That's that's really because the Chinese Americans came in and sort of opened up all of the lo'i that were the Hawaiian uh, community bread baskets. And I wanted to um, uh, say something from Abraham P. E. Naya. He always called it ka mo ili ili. And I'm I'm sorry. There's something that's that's. Um, Okay, uh, uh, Mo being a contraction of Moana or ocean, meaning vast, like the ocean is vast, and Ili Ili, meaning the small stones, because this whole area was Ili Ili. It's still today that's covered very much. So I guess more from a geological and geographical interpretation of the name, he talked about the vastness of the Ili Ili. That's what Ka Mo Ili Ili really means. Ka Moana Ili Ili, the ocean at one time, geologically covered all of Mo Ili Ili. And of course, a lot of guys don't buy that, the Moana name, but that's okay because those um, that he shared it with, we can buy it. And he didn't throw out the Mo'o story we always hear, but my dad's explanation was that it probably was the Ili Ili that had a kind of lizard body, snaky body. So the name doesn't have anything to do with a stone or lizard lizard or a lizard turned into snow stone sorry or pieces of lizard turned into snow, stone but that's how the stories are created right and and Gor that's gordon p e and i who spoke for his father abraham p e and i and what's uh, abraham p e and i for those who may not be familiar with his name he's really the founder of the hawaiian studies um program that uh, is now up at uh and this is just to show you the community of the um of the Hawaiian community, which is Rice Memorial Chapel before it was torn down, but before that it was Ka Mo Ili Ili Church. And uh, then you can notice the grave sites are right next to the cemetery, right next to the church. And th this is the um, Hongonji, the Mo Ili Ili Hongonji, the first 
one and the now the current one you can see on University Avenue, and those are low-lying areas. The, the school, which is Kohio, uh, darn, sorry, Kohio School, uh, which is now another type of buildings, but that was originally where the Kamo Ili Ili School was, right next to the church and cemetery. And this was the Japanese language school, which is still today called the Mo Ili Ili Community Center. So that gives you an idea of the communities. So what about the what about the uh, Mo Ili Ili Japanese Cemetery? Uh, this is an overview from the pedestrian um, overpass, and you can see it. This is actually in an early day because there's you can see a lot of um, soil there and a very um, um, poor uh, driveway, very much with potholes. Um, and historically speaking, it was laid out in uh, ways that were very grid-like, almost grid-like, but it was irregular grid-like. And if you can see to the uh, far um, the middle right side, you can see a, a brown line. That was the property line, but the green represents the post where there was a shrine. Apparently every morning the um, caretaker um, had a service there. And the Boy Scouts came out regularly. Um, I might mention that in the foreground, there is the tall um, vertical um, posts. These are wooden posts. When uh, someone was first buried there, often uh, that was just the uh, commemoration that's called an ehi. And it um, uh, was usually there was a small one that was taken to the family shrine. But these um, ehis may have never had enough um, money, so to speak, to be able to afford an actual stone. So these were the first commemorations, and usually it was replaced with what's in the center, which is a, a blue stone. Uh, and I I have not actually found it in the cemetery. Around the blue stone also, you notice there'll be curb stones all around. That seems to be a, a standard way of doing it in any cemetery. And I always like to say that they're sort of the size of a tatami mat. And some of the things that took place in the cemetery, these are all the boys that are playing. The, um, the Ogasawara boys are down in the lower left and other friends are there doing various things. What you see is the old, very old um, uh, caretaker's house. There was another one that was built that was two stories. It was um, uh, later in time, but there are no caretaker houses today. And you can notice that the um, fence behind is uh, wooden and of course wood deteriorates. So there's been changes. You also see that there's the curbstones and these are the curbstones that paved all of the streets downtown um, also. So, and um, another historic photo is the um, Mr. Zanami who was a musician and orchestra leader. And this is their family. And I bet it's the orchestra itself in the um, white uh, jackets and, and black bow ties that are there also. And this is a uh, when I do give tours of the cemetery, and I do welcome groups that would like to do that, that I, I really welcome them. Um, some of the people can come right close and they can see, they can read the actual song that's his famous one, and they will actually be able to sing it. So it's quite, um, uh, quite a memory. And another, this is another family. You can see the wooden fence that's, of course, been long replaced over to the far left. You can see the uh, mailbox, and that was for the Oyamata uh, Rose Garden, and they lived in there until they were asked to move out somewhere, uh, I think, in the 1940s. This, is, this would be, quote, the end of the cemetery as far as um, um, monuments go. And so here's to give you a sense of the configuration. Um, and all of the, almost all of the haka are facing towards the center driveways. So you would see facing um, B would face towards A, C faces towards D, so forth. E is a newer part of the cemetery. And so that is not quite oriented the same way. Uh, there's a few in the cemetery that are oriented towards the West. And if you go to other cemeteries, uh, you may find that they're all oriented towards the West. So that's um, that, that's been my research and I've um, found it interesting. But I think because this was a narrow strip of land that they that the original founders did it uh, in this particular way. So this is the entrance to the cemetery, and it's on the conjunction of um, Kuile and Waiaka roads. And it um, this was the original historic entrance. Unfortunately, when Kapiolani was cut through in the 1930s, um, they gave it some strange address on um, uh, 
Kapilani, and but there's no entrance there. So it's stuck that way. Uh, so anyway, this is, but there was no um, bronze plaque there when we started at, uh, 12 years ago, uh, but we put that in. And then a few years back, the Lions, um, Cocoa Head Lions Club uh, adopted us as a legacy project that they come out every other Sunday. So what, um, what can you look for if you want to discover things in the cemetery or you want to know more about uh, you know, family or, or you're researching for historical reasons? So what are the sizes, shapes, and engraved carvings that you might look for? The wood, which I just mentioned was the post, which is called the Ehi, might be there. We have only one that's left and it just has no longer has any um, a kanji on it at all. Uh, there's a few with wooden fences that are left. We might restore some of those because the wood is um, deteriorating quickly. And then there's native stones, which would be a natural boulders uh, coming right from the cemetery, pretty sure, or the blue stones from the nearby Mo'ili Ili Quarry. That was an uh, uh, occupation for many of the, the first um, Issei, that is the first um, Japanese um, immigrants who became Japanese Americans. And the karst or sandstone, very rare, but it, it is uh, on some of the stones. That's the coral. Uh, marble, very rare. Marble deteriorates rather quickly in terms of um, cemetery uh, monuments. Um, you'll see them in the um, 19th century um, uh, cemeteries, and they, you can see how worn they are wet, weathering. And granite and cement are also um, uh, in the, found in our cemetery. Carvings were either engraved, that is cut into the stone, or relief where the um, uh, letters uh, pop out at the individuals. So here's some uh, types of monuments. On the up, upper um, right, uh, left, I'm sorry, is a, a very interesting one because all of the previous uh, haka are there on the um, uh, the bigger one, uh, which there are blue stones on the left and then the large granite one and other things are there. Uh, on the right are the blue stones that you can see and, and below is the na uh, native stone that's there and the um, on the lower left is a, um, one that I restored, which is a, a cement um, uh, headstone. Uh, notice in all of these, they all have uh, what we call pedestal stones. So some have one or two pedestal stones, uh, and and then they often have a um, uh, inscribed um, curb curb area. And um, in the in the cemetery, there are there are five. Um, Jiso. Those are small guardian images for infants and children, protectors of deceased children, including miscarried and aborted, aborted infants. What's interesting about this area of the oldest part of the cemetery, there's many, many small um, headstones. And these were uh, children or infants that did not live more than a few days or a few months. And of course, it's very sad. We know that in the early days of the 20th century, there were uh, there was a big sort of plague, and there were, of course, influenza, and every, uh, all kinds of other diseases, and not uh, antibiotics, and not very good, perhaps, uh, medical care. Uh, this is an example. This is an enclosure with a fence. Um, we, I might, uh, I'll show it uh, another thing later, but right, we couldn't tell exactly what was on that um, small headstone inside the enclosure. But the way we do it when we go out to the cemetery is we can put shaving cream on the surface and then squeegee it down. And we can often see little imprints of what was there before. It is basically worn off, but it's a way of recording on very rough um, uh, native stones and other um, degraded um, uh, headstones. And on the right is um, something that's a, it's a sort of a Western um, convention because it's a book, but it must have been a scholar or a, or a teacher that was given that. If it had been somebody who was actually thinking of Japanese roots with um, a traditional teacher or scholar, it would have been a scroll. But this is a book, this is interesting. And then uh, the types of stones and materials used. This is um, Sentaro Otsubo's carvings. Uh, he was a master stone carver, lived in the community, and carved many, many of the stones that were with are within the uh, cemetery itself, as well as other locations. Um, and I might tell you more about the um, uh, the jiso that he carved at Bamboo Ridge and so forth. 
Um, you can always put things in the chat if you ask questions. Uh, on the left is a blue stone that he carved. And notice that there's two pedestals plus the curved stones. And the middle one is one he carved himself. But of course, he could not put his death date there. But that is, um, that is a granite of different types of granite. And it shows both the engraving and the relief um, uh, lettering. And then on the right is um, uh, Senator Dan Inouye's grandparents, and it's a very dark uh, granite. And the lower portions are a very fine concrete that really looks like um, stone when it's um, uh, installed. And some of the noteworthy individuals, and I, uh, by the way, I want to say almost everybody in the cemetery was hardworking. They really worked their whole lives to save for their families and to hope for a better life in Hawaii. What they were looking for is to be remembered by people uh, that came after them. And uh, this the one on the upper left, you may be familiar with, that's the uh, Miles Fukunaga uh, Memorial. Uh, it says, um, heap o misfortune. And it was, uh, uh, he was uh, uh, unfortunately uh, uh, an, uh, ill and, and um, mentally um, probably uh, compromised individual who, uh, I'll shorten the story, killed a, a small child and was hoping because he wanted his family to stay in the home, but the landlord wanted to evict them and he was hoping, I think, to get money, whatever. What it, it did was it caused a, a real scare in the Japanese American community because they thought maybe the rest of the community would uh, attack other Japanese Americans. It, uh, it didn't happen particularly, but that was a concern. The uh, one on the right is Mrs. A. Lopez. She lived right in the community. I find that was quite nice. She must have visited all the time. And people, uh, the caretakers or whomever, decided that when she passed that she should have her, her gravesite in the cemetery also. So notice she's, she's also a Christian. And then a few more of these, um, the, uh, the lower uh, left is the, the Francis Zanami that I told you about before that's, that's right there at the um, driveway area. And then um, on the upper left is um, uh, Bruce Ito's wonderful photo with the rainbow and everything of the Kimura family. Mr. Kimura apparently was a sake distributor and he probably had lots of very large parties because people, after he passed, um, uh, or I believe he might have even gone back to Japan or anyway, it, this is a memorial to him um, as from all of his friends, I think. And it was, it's a very nice fitted blue stone uh, pedestal and um, sort of curb stone seating area. The other two, I don't know much about the uh, Sakai family, but they are um, they have do, do come to the cemetery occasionally. And the Kageses were actually uh, fairly important in the community. They had the Rainbow Shower Tea House that's no longer there now. And also Mrs. Kagesa was a teacher at Kuhio School. Uh, Morimoto was the first caretaker. He, he had a business in downtown, I believe it was, a, uh, it might've been a restaurant. And when uh, the cemetery was started, he was one of the founders and he gave up his business to become the caretaker for the first many, many years. So he his is, quite possibly, I think, a memorial rather than uh, an actual um, burial. And you know that it was for a good period of time early on, uh, there were body burials. Uh, today, it's almost all um, cremated um, or, or remains in urns. Uh, I did see one body burial in the last 10 years, but that was very unusual. Um, the uh, family on the right, the Otani family, they, interesting story, they have a big fish market that was going to open on December 7th, 1941. Well, that certainly didn't happen, uh, but they continued on in their in their business. And then below is the Koga family. And uh, James Koga Koga is a well-known um, printmaker, artist, and he comes every year and puts out the, um, the lanterns. The lanterns themselves are subject to the high winds that we have today. So I don't know how many lanterns might be around, but that's, they're, they're really quite beautiful at dusk. And then the um, two Hanai Hawaiian headstones of Noah Kepoikai and uh, Abage Abigailia uh, Ellen uh, Hakulele Pony or Pony as she was known, Kamakau. Uh, this is an extended large family, comes from a 
common progenitor. And they, uh, you might notice the Kamakau is a familiar name because that she is the daughter of Samuel Kamakau, the, the noted historian. And if you want, I will tell you how the stones got to the Mo'ili'ili Japanese cemetery. Just put it in the chat and I'll, I'll fill you in. And then some of the ways that you can look at the um, uh, the haka in the cemetery. And these are sort of like cheat sheets to help you understand a few of the kanji, even if you don't speak Japanese or read Japanese, and I do not, but I can take these uh, characters and match up things. The lower portion uh, shows a family, it just means of the family or of the grave. The lower one is where there's two vertical lines. You know, the, traditionally, the husband's name is on the right and the woman the wife's name is on the left so you can recognize it that way and then there is the um uh the top care uh, on the side this is a convention it's usually on one side or the other but more often probably on the um what would be the left side um it's the um the kanji characters that show the prefecture in this case it's the uh, yamaguchi um which is then which is the ken but it also reads down to the Goon and the smaller village and the still smaller village. And this is actually the ancestry that if people would like to research any one in here, they can go back to the small village or the or the Goon or whatever and find ancestral records. Uh, so this is a this was the way of the, the Issei generation, the first generation uh, that was passing on, wanted to know people to know where they came from. Uh, there are there are markers in the cemetery that have no prefectures, but that's because they were probably born in Hawaii. And then there's the birth characters, and then the uh, birth the death dates, two diff different ways of writing them. And then I believe the top one is the um, Shingon um, symbol, and the bottom one is the for the Nichiren sect. And then there are the Western um, style ones. That's a marble one with an with a, um, enameled photo of the woman. And then again, I mentioned the uh, religious imagery and the, and the uh, scholarly imagery and uh, people who follow the Christian path rather than the Buddhist path. Uh, some of the other things you might see on the headstones are the moan. That is the um, symbol of the the family symbol, the family name, the moan, and they often will symbolize, as I mentioned in the bottom part, different um, things that have certain things like the crane is a long life, so forth. Um, and some do not have them on them, but uh, others do. And some may be ones that they have uh, taken on from some other location. And then there's also floral motifs um, my only reading of the floral motifs is that uh, somewhere at the stone carvers, they said, oh, wouldn't you like to have pictures of flowers on your gravestone? Or mother liked um, roses or, uh, you know, we grew hasu or something like that. That might be the reasons for why they chose to have the floral motifs. But I, I don't have any um, uh, historical information about that. And then this is what we uh, finally put together just in a few weeks ago, which is a display case of all the artifacts that we found at the cemetery and nearby. And this is the principal with um, all of the rest of us, our workers. And this um, this um, display case was built by the a men's shed. And that the tallest man in the back is the, uh, was the head of this president of the men's shed. And um, this was quite nice, a collaborative effort. And um, I might say that all of the restoration for the cemetery and for the display case and anything else uh, is through the kindness of donors. And that, that is the only way that we have been operating. If you want me to talk about what's happening at the Manoa Chinese Cemetery, please put it in, your ch in the chat and I'll respond to that also. But for, for some of this, some of the um, uh, artifacts, the upper right is a mortar, which possibly was for herbs or something like that. It has some uh, cylindrical stratifications on it. But it was these were things after a period of time, they were discarded. So we found a, a pestle and we found a, a fishing, uh, a squid lure and a tofu block, some of the older ones. And then in the uh, middle sections, we found uh, this is a mule shoe on the lower right and a horseshoe on the middle section. Um, they were just either thrown off the, the 
animals or they were thrown away, one of them. And then in the lower left is um, what we believe is probably an opium bottle. And then the one in the middle is a medicine bottle with graduated marks on it. So we're looking forward to finding other ones. Whenever anybody excavates or turns over things, I usually look and see what's in the hole or what they brought up and we try to save them. The bottles are on the top, many bottles. And then here's one of the ways that you record things. This is giving uh, talks at the cemetery um, is I have them find a, a stone that they want to um, do a rubbing on. And we just put up the interfacing and the, uh, the, the, what's rubbed on is sort of like a fat crayon that rubs on it. Lower one is done with pencil, a little bit harder to do. And then um, I wanted to go into if it's a nomination and or um, for the state or national historic registers, um, or if it's genealogy, here are some of the things that you would you would find yourself doing. First of all, to map the cemetery, um, if it doesn't already have a map, and, and do it the best you can. Um, working in, in Honoka'a now at the Honoka'a Japanese Cemetery, um, we have done our best by you know doing it on the ground, putting in little um, squares and marking um, the grave sites. But if we had a drone that we could go over above, we could have a good recording and then uh, transfer our uh, paper um, information to an actual uh, good map of the cemetery. And then record everything on the gravestones. That's all four sides. Some stones don't have things on all sides. And then photograph um, an overview and the specific grave sites. The overview is will help you find it if you can see things like I was showing before, uh, a fence or uh, um, some other uh, uh, grave sites behind that will help you find find them. Um, research the history of the rural cemetery movement. That's a little beyond us in Hawaii, but it's worth it if you want to go that far to find out more about how cemeteries are developed. And then um, really important is research the astronomical, geological, social, cultural, geographical location of the cemetery. As I mentioned before, it's all about the geological um, location that is here, but it's also a social and cultural um, uh, point because the founding of the, the, the coming together of the Hawaiian uh, community and the Japanese American community was quite um, linked at, in the early days of the um, early 20th century. And then research historical documents and photographs of the period. That of course brings you to the archives or the um, Bureau of Conveyances. And then uh, here are some of the things that you can look up on um, online or go down to the locations, the census documents, are very important because they tell occupations and they tell ages of children and so forth. And the Polks and Holstead directories give you what businesses they, they really won't give you addresses, but they'll give you where they are, generally speaking. And then uh, newspaper morgues and the uh, TMK, uh, the tax maps uh, and the and county documents. We have things called the um, uh, field books, and then the Bureau of Conveyances for the Transfer of Property Ownership. Uh, that one is a sort of a harder one to do because the books are extremely heavy. For me to get them down off the top shelf, I have to transfer them to my head to get them to the table to look at the books. So just to let you know. And then there's other ones that are the awards, the um, Land Commission Awards System. We are, the cemetery is in Kuile, Kuile proper, but those are the other Land Commission Awards that were given in the nearby area. And then for, as for maps, um, this was from the um, Japanese Cultural Center. Uh, they had this map from 1939, and it's really good for telling the, uh, the businesses that were in place at that particular time. And um, you can get derive a lot of information from the maps. And then this is a hand-drawn map by uh, Sidney Kashiwabara. His grandfather was the sort of the founder of the Japanese American community in Mo'ili'ili. And he does, um, they do have a um, haka in the cemetery. And um, the, Mr. Kashiwabara, the elder, um, was fluent. After he finished his contract uh, in three years, he came here. But he was, the, the thing about him was he was fluent in both Japanese, English, and Hawaiian. And that made the um, people coming to the community, it was a much easier fit because they could, they could help him to, uh, he would help them negotiate. And then this is a recent map done by uh, two, two individuals. This is by uh, Miss uh, uh, Richard Ogasawara and Jean uh, um, 
uh, Hirai Matsumoto, who, who lived down in, in this area right here, I'm sorry, at the o Oyamata Rose Farm. And they both, both Richard started the map and then um, June added to it. And these are all the people that they are thinking were there and what location, generally speaking, and what was there um, for uh, um, the recreation. And I would say in the 40s, uh, 1940s, basically, maybe into the 1950s. So get as many maps as you can. Uh, I also do interiors of stores and ask people to say, where, where were the displays and so forth. And this is an example of a directory. So you can find uh, people's names and something about who they were and sort of, you know, here it says Parker Lane near King. I mean, that sort of gives you half an idea. And then this is the only deed I've found so far, which is um, the uh, uh, Ota, uh, Haka, and um, there may be more, but notice it's just done on school paper uh, by signed by Mrs. Uh, Okasawara. And then how, how do you read the stones? As I mentioned before, one of the things to note, and this I did for the Hiroshima uh, Kenjin Kai, uh, is that um, there's two, this is an older reading of Hiroshima, and here's a newer reading of Hiroshima. So if you were to go out and try to look to find more Hiroshima ones, you'd have to know both of the, the sets of characters to be able to find them. And to give you, um, this is just to give you an idea of the 1924 Japanese population. Um, and this is basically follows the older sections of the A, B, C, and D of the older part of the cemetery. What happened in the um, late 50s, really early 60s, was that there must have been, and this is my assumption, um, an ad place, a classified ad that said there's new cemetery um, land opening up, come and get reserve your plot. And I think it was probably a coconut wireless with the Okinawan community, because there's far more Okinawan community um, uh, family hakas there uh, in the newer sections today. And then this is this is how we got started. At, in um, uh, 2011, uh, we found out that there was this um, Oahu um, um, uh, Awesome Foundation. We applied for it and got our first grant. We had really no money to start up. What happened is Harriet Natsuyama, who's on the right, um, she and I were at the cemetery one day and we said, this is just a junk pile. And if we don't do it, who will? So that started us on the route to get this grant. And then we got another small grant from um, the Mo Ili Ili Hongwanji. And that helped us get started so that we could uh, tear down the ratty old fence and um, do get a whole lot of the junk out of the cemetery. So you can see this. This is before there was just everywhere. People had piled up extra stones, um, spilled concrete, uh, whole trees, things like that. and. Um, there were there's also was some toppled stones. Um, if anybody in the audience has somebody who knows a, a, a crane operator that can lift these up, we can fix them so they'll stand upright. They're collapsed probably because it was a body burial and there has been a collapse in the uh, the lower um, portion of the of the soil and it's caused them to they're very heavy and they cause them to tip. Um, there's um, we've also had collapses that are holes after huge rains. And um, we just, we fill them in and respectfully um, mark them because those are uh, were body burials, which has probably have uh, coffin collapses. And this is a starting day with people uh, just to show you. And then this is what we, what they did. They were not wearing sensible shoes, although I did ask for sensible shoes. And then this is to give you an idea. We filled up five of those dumpsters. This was after we had an, oops, we had enough money to be able to take down the old fence, which had had cars run into it and it had graffiti on it. And it was like a chain link fence with the ratty old Venetian blinds on it. So this is the starting of our project. And frankly, uh, we didn't really know where the money was gonna come from to get the stones because we didn't have enough stones on the site itself. So 556 feet of stone are the, the man in the green shirt is uh, Dario Bedan, who is an excellent mason. And he helped us um, all volunteers do this whole um, stone wall. It was a major accomplishment. And you can see it today. It's um, uh, 
30 inches high because you don't have to have a permit if you go only 30 inches high. And this is just to show you some of the activities. Uh, this was a monster activity of washing uh, some of the large stones. Um, oh, by the way, before I started um, on this, I asked um, um, Bishop uh, Eric Matsumoto of, of the Homba Honganji if we, it was okay if we would have adaptive reuse of the stones that were no longer part of anybody's um, uh, haka or gravesite. And so these are all were way too big to do anything with. So, but we did get them moved. Uh, so that they became one of our washing stones. We wanted to try to put the washing stones in up higher so that people wouldn't have to bend over so much when they come to wash their faces for, for, to put flowers. And then this shows you Diamond Head, and that is, I hate to say it, soon to be obscured by a monster building. And then this is the this is the first day of the um, uh, celebration, our very first celebration of what we had done so far with the cemetery. And that's the um, Obon celebration with the dancing around the baby Yagura Tower, the mini Yagura Tower. And uh, we were able to do that for a few years. And then the potholes got so bad on the, on the driveways that we couldn't do it. We will be able to do it now coming up in this next year. Um, so it's um, please come out. Um, it's at Obon time, and we just have a short ceremony, and then we have Obon and refreshments. And um, it was really a celebration that we could actually say that the cemetery is back to where people want to go. And I always say we'd like to have it beautified for the next for the next hundred years. And uh, this is to show you just some of the gravel that was placed in there. The stone on the right is now fixed. But um, it's just to show you that gravel was put in because when we have huge rainstorms like we had a few weeks ago, all of the soil erodes and it was um, undermining some of the, the haka. And so the gravel is to slow down the erosive process. And then this is my first haka restoration I did. I've done many more, maybe, I don't know, 20 or more. Um, I found it just in parts and I didn't know what I had. It was just on the upper left. I had just pieces of concrete and what I could see inside was an, a, a, when it was broken open, there was an eroded four by four with nails on it. So the family or a friend had um, put concrete around the um, wood and the, and the nails and it had subsequently uh, rotted out with the um, water seeping in. And that was, um, that was um, the way that the concrete was busted. Well, I put it back together again and it became became the first one that I restored. There are many, many more there. And then let, to show you an idea, um, Ralph mentioned that there are 90 trees, but just in the last couple of weeks, we've added more trees. So we now have over a hundred trees, um, I'll show you. Uh, and those are when they're first growing. Some of these are early on growing. And some of the very large stones we found, we found uh, we use them for, for seating, for people sitting on them. And uh, there's so, some places that the lower left, we had not put in some gravel in that large open uh, um, crap, oops, sorry, um, uh, curb enclosure. And uh, these are the washing stones and seating areas. And then if you look through the three, the three square rectangles of stones, those were what I did during COVID is I took all of the stone piles that were in the cemetery. Uh, now they could be grave sites and they could and untended, or they could be just piles of stone. We don't know, but we're honoring them all in, in our various ways. And this is the start of, we had to get permission from the state. This is outside on the state property. Uh, to plant things. And they said, sure, go ahead. And so we planted the uh, large, the, what are now, uh, I'll show you, uh, the, this is today's view, uh, the manila palms uh, and the plumerias. And we just planted a couple of weeks ago, the three kukui trees that are there now. They haven't really um, set out their, their canopy yet. But uh, we were subject to a car crash, uh, which still hasn't been resolved yet and uh, took out some of the trees there. And so the kukui trees are replacement trees. And at the other end of the cemetery in city land, we had to get permission also to plant the um, vegetable gardens. And this is, again, this is remnant parcel that is, would never be used for anything, but we've turned it into the community gardening spot. 
And all we say is respect the garden, respect the cemetery. We don't have any rules. Or anything. And then here's the entrance way again. And just to show you, and we have more bougainvilleas to come just for color. And we inside we have the um, Mexican petunias, which are purple color. We'll be glad to give you cuttings for any of those. Um, and uh, this is just another view. This is again from the uh, pedestrian overpass showing you it's before the a driveway was repaved. Again, through the kindness of donors, we were able to uh, get the driveways repaved. And this is the memorial uh, that was done in 1968. And it was uh, to honor the very, very first Japanese Americans. And below is the website, which if you're coming out to the cemetery and you want to find where some someone is located or some family is located, go to the website first, find their name you know, in A, B, C, D, or E, and then alphabetically, it'll show the name. And then you can go inside the website and you can find the Excel spreadsheet, which gives all the information translated by um, uh, Joel Bradshaw, who did a wonderful job knowing both the um, old Japanese and the newer Japanese. And then this is the book that came out in um, at the very beginning of tw uh, 2006, and it started in uh, 2002. And um, this was um, a, a lot of old timers at the Mo'ili Ili Community Center sitting around talking story. Finally, some of us came together for longer story, of course. And we said, "We there's a book here, let's do it. And so this is the book that comes out came out in the beginning of 2006. Six. And if you do wish a copy, there are still some at the Mo'ili Ili Community Center that you can get for very low price because we wanted to make sure it was available to all, all people. So just, um, just uh, to give a little bit more is just to let you know what you should be doing or telling your folks if they come out and want to restore a cemetery to respect the cemetery and always I did have to tell my honor students who were recording all four sides of this of the stones throughout the cemetery to please not climb on the haka and please respect them if you have to step anywhere on them um, and then uh, asking yourself too how how might you ensure the cemetery's well-being into the future that's what we're hoping for is the next hundred years of, of a garden spot. And, and then how can you engage your community? And how do you work to restore, but also respect the cemetery? You can't really put in things that are not historically appropriate. And by the way, this is on the state and national historic register. So we want to keep it within the, the historical period. And then what are you going to be doing if you're going to um, adopt a cemetery or work on a cemetery, beautifying, cleaning, recording, restoring stone and concrete markers, restoring or creating period appropriate gateways, walls, seating, and washing stones and planting trees, um, adopting untended grave sites, those are, we call them orphans also, and installing a plaque. Those are all things that we have done. And uh, the community uh, starting out, what is the community buy-in and individual organizer commitment? We did not go for a 501c3 because that would have taken too long, would have required a board of um, directors and uh, probably a lawyer to figure it out for us. So we wanted to get started right away. And so that's what we did. And so uh, permission from the property owner, it's technically owned by the Japanese Cemetery Association. Uh, there's a small portion that's overseen by that association at the Makiki Cemetery also. And the uh, uh, president of that is uh, Clifford Hosoi, who's uh, with Hosoi Garden Mortuary. But he is um, uh, basically he gave us permission and we just proceeded from there. And some of the uh, small funds for water and and uh, restoration are do come from the uh, Japanese Cemetery Association. And then we put notices on the bulletin boards, the pillars, gates, we put it everywhere, applied for grants, um, grants, uh, request donations. We send out, every year we send out a brochure that tells us what, tells people what we've been doing in the last year. We did open a bank account and um, then we gathered every possible thing. We sent, we sent thank yous to all of our donors and we have donor appreciations in all sorts of ways. And then what we're, we would hope to have would be a younger generation that would come along and say, hey, we'd like to be the stewards. We'd like to take charge. That's in the sense all the cemeteries are waiting for. 
And then uh, how do you record the cemetery again? Mapping, first thing out, photographing, rubbings, and then website. And then um, community volunteers, you organize the volunteers, sensible shoes, hats, sunscreen, gloves, release forms signed by all local school service clubs and volunteers. Involvement. And with, with the um, uh, Cocoa, Cocoa Head Lions comes the Leos, which are the uh, Kaimuki High School group of leadership group that is uh, comes out also every other Sunday to help out. So we do have um, them as our legacy project. And then um, we had lots of service clubs coming out at different times. Certainly, if you have a service club that would like to do something, we'd be very happy. And then um, um, Usually we've had bottled water and we definitely have lunches provided for everybody. So let me uh, let me see what the chat is, if I can, and I'd like to answer any questions. And, and if we can go backwards wherever, I don't. Andrea? I'm sorry. Do do we have anyone in the chat? Yes, Ralph is here to help. I had just been shut down. My computer uh -oh. shut down. So don't, oh, no. don't, worry, don't mind me. Ralph will continue with the Q&A with you. Okay. You can stop your screen share, Laura. No, no, no. no. I want to, I, I just want to. Oh, you want to share? Here. Okay. No, I just wouldn't want to hear it. But here, Ralph, Ralph, go ahead, please. Okay. So uh, Jessica Kawamura uh, sent a question. Our family has a great grandfather Carioca, who also did stonework on Oahu. Uh, she was wondering if he did any of the gravestone carvings. Unless there's some kind of paper acknowledgement or unless she knows the particular style that he uh, carved in, probably not. When um, Harriet and I first started out as the co-coordinators of the cemetery at the time, and Anne was also a co-coordinator, but when Harriet and I started out, she went out and she has um, uh, she touched all of the stones that she believed were done by her grandfather. They have a certain kind of smoothed edge around the carving, and the the, the best of carvings, which possibly was also with the other uh, stone carver was that they had a kind of depth so that it was light and shadow that really captured the um, uh, kanji or the or the calligraphy. And, um, and today it's done all mechanically and there really isn't any kind of uh, varied depth and lots of people choose to put gold or, or white or black in, in the actual engravings, which is not really the way the earliest um, stone carvers intended to have the depth to be conveyed, co convey the meaning through light and shadow. Okay. Uh, another question How did a Kamakau end up at this cemetery? Ah, thank you for asking that one. That was the one I wanted to have asked. Well, this um, one day, this was a, just a few years ago, uh, Harriet called me up and she says, Quick, come quick, we found some headstones in our yard. And this was the Coolidge Street is just, a, you know, a, a, you know, half a mile away at the most. Um, this was this was the place where her grandfather, Santaro Otsubo, carved all of his stones in the backyard. Well, when uh, Harriet's parents uh, decided to put in a two story building with the um, uh, they lived upstairs and below was the restaurant. So this in this current time, uh, the restaurant had to have a grease trap put in. So they excavated a hole in the ground. And all of a sudden, here were these headstones that showed up. Well, much to our surprise, first of all, we I had um, uh, Susan Lebo, the um, uh, archaeologist from uh, Shipti, came out and determined there was no burials there. They were turned face down, and they had concrete coating on top of them. Now, what they were used for is that Centaro Otsubo had to roll heavy stones around. So you put pipes down and you roll them or you pick them up in certain ways and she, he had to have a flat surface to work on. So these and other ones, there was the Arakawa stone also um, there that I could see, but I could not pull it out because the excavator would not let me. He said it would compromise the slab that was above it. But that was the first, uh, Araka was the first um, Japanese seaman that was um, buried at over at uh, Makiki Cemetery. And uh, what happened is somebody uh, decided to carve a new one, just like the old one. 
And what I could see was just a little bit of the kanji. I sent it to my friend, Joel um, Bradshaw, who translated it. And he says, my goodness, that's the same one is at, is at the Makiki Cemetery. So it's now, unfortunately, underneath um, Harriet's um, uh, um, yard uh, area. But these two, we were able to save and bring over to the Mo'ili'ili Cemetery. Now, the real question is, how did they get, first of all, to Mr. Otsubo's to be there? And notice they're 1884 and 1881. Um, the um, the Kei is does not say, it says in memory of, meaning that he was never really buried with this particular headstone. But um, po Pony was, uh, she, they were both, both Maui people uh, from, from a, a single ancestor in the Kipahulu area. And um, they, um, but then at a certain point, um, the father of, um, uh, Pony, hey, um, Samuel Kamakau, uh, they all moved uh, after many years, they they moved, that family part moved to Oahu uh, near the um, Emma Street or Queen Emma area where uh, people that were probably, uh, it was a Hawaiian community, um, mostly probably a better well off um, and um, maybe better educated. Uh, this is a, a hypothesis, of course, um, but I think they were because they, they had uh, compounds and houses that were nearby in the lower Punchbowl area. So where where were these stones originally? So, and who did they, who carved them? Uh, who and who uh, commissioned the carving? Uh, I um, We went to many, many grave, yards, cemeteries that were uh, 19th century ones. And we found the uh, commonality in a few places, but they would not have been buried there. Uh, actually, Mr. and Mrs. Kamakau are buried in Oahu Cemetery, but there was no uh, headstone for um, Noah Kea Poikai. Um, they, we found that they were 99.9% .9 sure that these were from the um, uh, Roman Catholic Cemetery on King Street. What we found is a Kamakau enclosure, which has a small stone by a, a young child who passed away and also a Christian cross in there. But what is most notable is that there's two of the lower pedestal um, stones that are still there. The top pedestal stones are not there. So when we discovered these two stone, these headstones, they both, both had broken off at their pins underneath almost all of the stones, the headstones have pins that extend up into the headstone and down into the, the top pedestal. But there was no pedestal stones uh, extent that we were there, um, but we could see the broken ones. The Kei Poikai um, uh, stone had a weathered, you know, meaning it was pushed over by a big wind or by somebody. And the um, uh, Kamakawa one was, um, broken because of uh, weathering, because the um, iron uh, pins rusted out and fell over. So at some point, uh, I don't know if it was family members or not, but somebody said, this is, uh, they are no longer uh, sanctified. Let's, we'll remove them and we'll have, a, a, again, the assumption is that, that it was a salvage company came and collected them. And I might add, uh, over the, uh, when they were building a new building near the Roman Catholic uh, Cemetery, there were a lot of headstones that were restacked at the edge of the property. And I don't know what happened to their grave sites, but they then disappeared after a while. And then also while teaching up at UH in the sculpture department, I noticed that there were many headstones that were brought up there for students to practice carving on broken or whole pieces of headstone. Uh, which is, you know, this questionable, it's adaptive reuse, but it's a questionable why the headstones were not left in place uh, in some honored position. So we brought them back here uh, to the Mo'ili'ili Japanese Cemetery in honored positions. Notice the crown flowers are growing um, behind them. Also, they're quite big right now. And, um, and so, um, uh, the mystery was that probably um, Mr. Um, Otsubo took uh, the salvages um, uh, recommendation and got them to his um, 
his yard and turned them face down and used them for paving. Now, this is actually uh, um, throughout the United States, this is a common practice to turn the headstones face down and use them for paving. And there's one in extant at Mai Mai Cemetery uh, in the like upper Newton Kalihi area, um, which is turned face down. It happens to be a uh, military headstone, but it's turned face down uh, in that cemetery there. So if a long story short, this is what I'm working on in terms of a manuscript to try to submit the, the great the great historical detective story that we came upon. So I hope that's not too long a, 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 an answer, but uh, you know, thank you. Thanks, well, so Laura, that's fantastic, Ralph. I don't wanna inter interrupt you. I just wanna let you both know it's a little after one. So um, I, we could do two things. We could end and say goodbye to everyone. Or for those who want to stay a little longer, and that really depends on you, Laura, if Ralph, if you think okay. there's one or two more questions that sure. you'd like to address That's with fine. Laura. That's good. Um, and then, of course, everyone who needs to leave, this will be on the recording, and so you can catch up. But I'll leave it to you two to decide how you'd like to proceed. Okay. I'd like to go on. Great. So we'll, we'll continue on, but um, this marks the end of the uh, formal part of the lecture. Uh, Laura's willing to stay around for some more questions. So I will pose them and uh, the recording can continue. Thank you. And before you continue, I just wanna thank everyone who did join us today. Um, I wanna thank Michelle Kisick, my colleague who's been fielding uh, a lot of technical stuff in the background as my computer shut down and restarted <laughs> twice. And we look forward to seeing you all next Thursday at the next lecture, the fourth one with Deborah Chang, who will be doing a presentation on Holualoa Korean Association Cemetery on Hawaii Island. And thank you so much. Um, I think let's address the questions, Ralph, maybe that people have already asked and I can forward those on to you if that's easier. I have them all in a group. Okay, that'd be wonderful. Okay, and thank you, Laura, for your graciousness and amazing thank you. breadth and depth of volunteerism and history. and community service for this. Okay, I'll be quiet and I'll pose you those questions, Ralph. So, um, Kimo Nakama has uh, sent a... Uh, mm -hmm question about the family Haka was severely damaged when a car crashed into the cemetery. I think you pointed out uh, mm -hmm. one of those. Would you be able to discuss what is happening with the insurance company? Uh, yes, uh, good point. Um, and I have to mention the name because I'm not recommending that insurance company. It's been a year now since the car crash and they still have not settled yet. Uh, what happened is a car came in at an extraordinary rate of speed going around a curve came and hit the fire hydrant, uh, hit the trees, knocked out the manila palm and the plumerias, uh, skidded along our wall. We were happy that we did such a good job as volunteers building the wall, and then hit a guy wire on the telephone pole and flipped over into the cemetery and damaged, severely damaged 10 of the family hakas. And Kimo's is one that was the most severely damaged. Uh, it, had, it was very beautiful with the um, enameled uh, portraits of everybody. We're simply waiting for, we, um, uh, it destroyed because of the water gushing from the fire hydrant. We were able to smooth out some of the um, uh, gravel that was on the cemetery so people could walk in there again. And we have now, re like I said, the kindness of donors, um, uh, a neighbor gave us the, the big kukui trees that are gonna be growing there but we're waiting for the um, insurance company to settle um, so that we can um, uh, go and restore the rest of the Hakka back to what they were before. Uh, this isn't a question, but Marsha uh, Campbell noted sure. that if anyone wants to trace their family back to Japan, they can go to the resource center and the Japanese cultural center. Right. Just one mm -hmm. yeah. That up. yeah, very good, yes. Uh, Kevin Kawamoto uh, oh, yeah. asked uh, if you could please elaborate on the Manoa Chinese Cemetery. 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Kevin. Well, this is a, a, a controversy. It's an old cemetery, has many grave sites in it and, and um, um, building structure or structures and has some, I think, sort of small um, uh, houses that people lived in at one time. Maybe they still do. And uh, it's been going for very long time, I think, at, at least back to the 1850s. Um, and um, what has happened is the people that are the trustees or directors have decided that they can't maintain the cemetery uh, without getting more revenue. And so they are not, are not set up the same way that we set ours up. Rather, they were just uh, whoever was buried uh, paid a certain fee and then they were able to. Um, uh, I mean, by the way, I should say our cemetery is basically full except for places, plots where people have not um, built something yet. Um, but at the, uh, the Chinese cemetery, um, with the, these um, trustees thought that they could bring in revenue by building a large building. And this was extremely inappropriate in the um, Manoa neighborhood. And it was, it is, they are uh, insistent, and I hope that they are not successful in, in removing um, dozens and dozens of trees in the area that's um, uh, part of the cemetery and putting in a affordable senior housing. Now the senior housing is good in itself. I'm, I'm a very much a pro affordable housing and rental units, but this was such a glare, uh, glaring um, uh, gash in the um, um, Manoa community that they have all rallied against it. Um, my particular feeling is the trustees do not want to do any work. They want to get revenue so that they don't have to do any work, that they can hire other people to do work. And the very disappointing thing is that they are paying themselves salaries. Now, that's for not doing much of anything. And I'm so sorry that that's the, the model that they have chosen, is you build on top of your, your um, existing land and to fill it in. There's very nice, wonderful ways that you can uh, have columbariums in that that it's a nice slope of a land you can do columbariums that are very low to the ground and do not show up and are are small in nature you know maybe curved ones or something like that and um that would be very appropriate to bring in revenue uh but uh they did not seem to want to go that route and i think that's really incorrect if you have to do something like that you do it in the least obtrusive way to the historical cemetery and to preserve the best of the Manoa community. Okay, a uh, question from Irene Zane. Uh, is there a map or list of Chinese specific cemeteries on Oahu? No, uh, I don't know if the specific ones, there's Paoa uh, has some, uh, and the and the Manoa one, uh, I'm really not sure of the others. Uh, it might be at the Hawaii State Archives. There might be some more information if somebody has done research on where where they're all located. I have a, a number of relatives buried in those cemeteries, so I, I do know that, at least in my research, I have not found any maps of the cemeteries themselves. Right. Right. So there yeah, are most, most of them don't have maps at all. And, and um, uh, at um, Honohina um, on the Big Island, um, they were thoughtful enough to put uh, numbers on all of their um, headstones. And they have a little board in front that has the numbers with the names and people can go and find them that way. That's uh, uh, maybe the only way to do it, but it's not a map per se. It's just that you have to hunt for your the number you're looking for, you know, whatever. Uh, question from Janice Hiroshi, Hirohama. Uh, what is the best way of submitting corrections to names listed on the website? Oh, just con just find the contact and I will try to do it. Oh, I'm so sorry if there's a mistake. We tried to do our very, very best to get things from this from the stones onto the website in perfect uh, uh, condition. But maybe, you know, we're we're not infallible. Okay. Uh, have you looked into doing side lit photography and other methods that do not involve touching the stones? This is from uh, Cami Klum. Uh, I've read that using anything other than water can get into the stones and damage them over time. 
Right, right. Especially marble stones. You really do not want to put bleach on them or anything else because they'll go into the pores of the of the stones. The uh, the blue stone and the granite are really impervious to any problems. And and there's a practice. Uh, uh, people coming into the cemetery to honor their ancestors, they will pour water and actually wash down their um, headstone and pedestal stones. Um, that really won't damage anything if it's granite or bluestone, but I would not want to do anything to the, the marble. Putting the shaving cream on um, to be able to highlight and see what's actually written there and usually on the native stones is uh, not degrading in any way and it just washes right off. So I, the, the lighting is, you're absolutely correct. If you have to catch them at certain times of the day when the lighting is raked from the sun in a certain way so you can catch all of the um, engravings. Uh, so that, I, um, if, I mean, like Bruce set up some, Bruce Ito set up some things at night to do some of his and they're very wonderfully um, photographed and in the book, I might add. Okay. Uh, another question uh, from Daisy Mirai. Uh, the blue stones from, are they from the Mowili'ili quarry? And is that the UH quarry? Yes, yes the, that is the UH quarry. We still call it that today. It is the uh, Mowili'ili quarry. And yes, probably most of the blue stones came from there. We can't be exactly sure. I'm sure somebody who does uh, uh, geological analysis of the stones can tell you exactly which flows they came from. But the blue stones are all certainly all local Oahu stones, but I believe they're probably mostly all Mo'ili'ili uh, flow um, quarry uh, stones. Okay. Um, well, I think we should take maybe one more question because, um, and then we can, then we can say goodbye. Is, did, did uh, I'm sorry, I had dropped off. Did Laura address the Kamokau um, stones earlier in her questions. Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, Another question? A uh, question about where the marble came from? Marble okay. stones? The, uh, particularly these, the, 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 the Kepoikai and Kamakau stones, I believe they were probably carved on the mainland somewhere. This is not the type of stone carving that really was done too much here locally, I don't believe. Uh, going to all the 19th century stones, this is uh, the comparison with the 19th century stones is that these are extremely fine filigree um, ornamentation on them. And I'm, I, we tried to do a, as much as we could a comparison with these stones. They're much larger than most of the stones in any of the many cemeteries that we visited. And they are also have much more finely um, engraved um, letter forms and everything. So I believe it's my guess that they might have been ordered from the main, somewhere on the mainland. That's all I can say. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Laura, and especially thank you for staying the extra time to respond to people's questions. We so appreciate it. Um, anybody Ralph, who wants, to, what anybody was that, who wants to contact, anybody who wants to contact, just okay. go to the moeliili.info and there's a contact there and you can contact me that way for more questions. Okay, great. I'll make sure to share that in the follow-up email that we do as well. Ralph, did you want to have the last words? And um, before you do, I just want to remind there's quite a few people still on. So thank you for staying the extra time. And please do complete your survey afterwards when, when you log out. And Ralph, I'll give you the last, <laughs> uh, Laura, the last again, uh, Thank you so much. Uh, the people in the chat have uh, indicated their, their appreciation and your manao. So thank you again. Thank you very much and thank all, thank all the volunteers and all the donors that have made this possible. We certainly do community preservation at its finest. Thank you so much. Aloha everyone, uh, ahui ho. We hope to see you next week, Thursday, same time, noon. And thank you, mahalo Dr. Cam. And thank you again to Michelle, my colleague and to everyone who tuned in. We'll see you next week.
Yes. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you, Laura.